All right, Commissioner Stewart, it's nice to see you. Um, seems like you brought a few folks with you. If you'd like to introduce them as well. And, yes. Um, I guess it's all yours. Thank you very much, and thank you for having us. We're happy to be here on this Friday morning. I like the Valentine's Day tie. Good reminder of the next holiday. Um, I'm Sarah Stewart. I serve as commissioner of the New Hampshire Department of Natural and Cultural Resources. And with me today are the directors of the five divisions that make up this agency. And I will ask them to each say their name and introduce themselves right now. Morning, I'm Brian Wilson, the director of the Division of Parks and Recreation. I'm Michael York, I'm the director of the Division of Libraries. I'm Ginny Luthi, I'm the director of the New Hampshire State Council on Rights. Good morning, I'm Ben Wilson, I'm the director of the Division of Historical Resources and the State Historic Preservation Office. Good morning, I'm Patrick Hackley, the director for the Division of Forests and Lands. Thank you. I'm the new Brad we have the new old Brad Simpkins because I have a family. We have the new Brad Simpkins and the new Phil Bryce. So you can imagine that. Um, <laughs> um, so what I thought we would do today, uh, Mr. Chairman, is I would take some time to share with you what I presented to the governor's budget director, which um, gives a nice overview of what we're looking to achieve in the 2024-25 biennium, and then we can um, have a conversation and take questions. Typically, I would be sitting next to our um, our business uh, administrator, Chris Marino. He is not here today, he's out sick. Um, but if there are any questions that we cannot answer, I'll be sure to uh, b get back to you. And in your packet, there is information on each individual division, as well as some charts and graphs that break down our overall department budget. So with that, I'm just going to share with you um, the presentation I gave on November 29th to the governor's budget team. Um, as we just mentioned, we're home to five divisions and our collective mission is to protect, preserve, promote, and manage the state's natural and cultural resources, supporting the New Hampshire's high quality of life and strengthening the experience of our residents and guests. The DNCR employs nearly 1,000 people each year. We manage over 220,000 acres of public land and maintain approximately 870 buildings of various types and uh, with a total value reaching nearly $50 million. We also maintain 22 bridges, 15 fire towers, 26 dams, 149 septic systems, 91 waterways, and over 300 miles of roads and parking lots. Um, and we are now in, in the middle of our winter season where we oversee the management of 7,000 miles of snowmobile trails. Our agency's broad scope of services is also illustrated in how we touch the daily lives of our citizens in every community of the state. Our programs, grants, and services have only expanded as a result of the COVID pandemic. For example, the Division of Historical Resources required project review and compliance program experienced a 30% increase. Growth is the key word in this budget request. Our state parks have seen significant growth in attendance, online reservations, camping, and retail sales. To respond to this growth, our state park season has grown to 36 weeks, opening earlier in the spring and staying open beyond Columbus Day. Similarly, the Division of Forests and Lands is also experiencing growth. We've helped to conserve several thousand more acres available for public access, and our forest rangers are seeing a lot more activity consistent with the growth in outdoor recreation. For the fifth season running, seedling sales at the New Hampshire State Forest Nursery in Boscoan continue to outpace the previous year's marks. Sales income increased 52% from 2021's record-breaking season and reflected a 146.7% increase since 2018. The total number of orders was up 37.6% from last year, which is just about double, 96.5% compared to five years ago. The number of seedlings, seedlings lifted, sorted for quality, packaged, and sold increased 50.8% from 2021, a 135.2% jump from 2018. In order to respond to this overall growth, we have evaluated our staffing needs and are requesting permission to convert eight 9T positions into full-time positions within parks, 
and 190 to permanent full-time uh, within the Division of Historical Resources. We would also like to add an additional forest ranger and an additional forester to assist us in monitoring over 270,000 acres of private land under conservation easements. I'm also seeking your support for three positions in the office of the commissioner. This agency relies on the legal advice of the attorney general's office. Over the past several years, it's become increasingly clear that with the number of contracts, lease agreements, rulemaking, and day-to-day -day interactions with the public, there is enough work to support a full-time agency attorney. I've discussed this need with the DOJ's attorneys that have been assigned to us, and they wholeheartedly agree. Another full-time position I wish to fill with your support is a DNCR financial analyst specializing in federal grant uh, administration. From the Land and Water Conservation Fund to the National Endowment for the Arts and the U.S. Forest Service, our five divisions administer millions of federal grants um, every year. And rather than continue to oversee a very siloed attempt to pull this off each grant, grant round, our staff would benefit from the support of a centralized service position. And I suspect the team at DAS would also appreciate the efficiency of working with a central point person rather than the many individual grant administrators sprinkled throughout our agency. Finally, a position I have advocated for in the past and truly believe will be a game changer for us is having a DNCR curator. As part of our mission, we are to provide access to the many treasures that we manage. This includes artwork, historic items, archeological finds, collections that have been donated to us and more. My vision is to hire someone who can help us organize our treasures and then help to develop public facing exhibits and programs at our state library, at our parks and historic sites, and even traveling exhibits to schools, local public libraries, and other community centers. We are currently seeking a consultant through the RFQ process to access the state library's current space and provide us with a plan to, uh, to store much of the stacks in a climate controlled storage facility freeing up valuable space for exciting and endless opportunities to engage the public. Other considerations in this budget request include accounting for dramatic increases in our utility expenses and interagency transfers. Something I would like to point out for discussion is the fact that since 2007, when the Bureau of Historic Sites was created, it was general funded. This was done on purpose in order to dedicate funds to the stewardship and management of our designated historic sites separating them from the parks funding, which, was, which has ebbed and flowed over the years. Historic sites also have a separate mission from parks, which is telling the stories of who we are through buildings, landscapes, collections, and exhibits. Two years ago, when we were asked to cut our overall general fund budget, we did so without compromising our commitment to the Bureau of Historic Sites. Instead, we shifted park revenue over, which you will see is what we did again this budget. Shifting back to general funds is something we would like to discuss further. Looking at our prioritized needs, we are making these requests consistent with our theme of growth and demand. New Hampshire's artists, cultural organizations, and for-profit venues were hit very hard during the pandemic and are not fully reco recovered. A recent survey of 53 nonprofit grantees, most of which receive Art Council operating support, showed 2022 earned revenue to date at 78% of the pre-pandemic levels. This is consistent with natural, national trends and is troubling. Additional state assistance will be needed for the fiscal year 24-25 biennium as they reorient their business models to what may be the new normal. We are also see, seeing an opportunity to push beyond critical needs to support the state's cultural assets in a way that fulfills the increased demand from the public throughout this sector. Specifically, requests for operating support have increased significantly as organi organizations mature and become eligible for grants. Applications to this two-year program increased 30% in fiscal year 22-23 over the previous biennium. Requ requests to the Arts and Health Grant Program have also increased, a 33% increase. We project continued growth in this program as pandemic recovery continues, particularly in the areas of behavioral health and substance misuse services. Due to this growth, we are requesting a new grants coordinator position to lead this program. The Arts Entrepreneurial Grant Program continues to grow as artists build, the, build and diversify their careers and small businesses. 
and there is a marked need for capacity building support for the emerging arts organizations, particularly in the areas of financial management and fund development. Much as the state allocated funds to boost outdoor recreation to meet the needs of the public, we see similar demand and opportunity within the arts. You will also see a request to support New Hampshire Public Television. Historically, New Hampshire PBS was supported by the state through UNH, 2.7 million annually, but funding was eliminated in 2011. New Hampshire PBS will utilize the requested funds to provide the state and country with engaging local content that showcases the state's rich natural, cultural, historical, and environmental resources. Some of the programming New Hampshire PBS will produce include our music and arts heritage and how it impacts the New Hampshire economy, documentaries about New Hampshire's hidden history, our diverse new populations, the vibrant farm to table movement, and much more. The amount requested will simply pass through our agency to New Hampshire PBS, but by allocating it to the Council on the Arts, we can count this money towards our federal match. This is a strategic way to make every dollar work hard for New Hampshire. In conclusion, the DNCR has sustained substantial growth over the past few years, and in order to move ahead on this trajectory, we have identified specific opportunities to put the pedal to the metal while staying within the 3% general fund growth limitation and by offsetting the new positions we need with several vacant positions that we can abolish. And with that, I open this to conversation. Are there questions for the commissioner, Representative McGuire? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Commissioner. Yes. Tell me more about this federal match. What qualifies? How much do you get? What are maximums and minimums and so on? Thank you so much. I'm going to let um, Ginny Lupi, who oversees our NEA um, uh, grant opportunity, speak to that because it's a, a consistent annual conversation about how we will reach a match so that we can maintain the, uh, the, the amount of money that's available to us. Ginny, do you want to speak to that? Why don't you come up? Okay. Yeah, all these are being taped and broadcast, so we need you at the mic. Thanks. First name is Ginny, G I N N I E, and the last name is Lupi, L U P as in Paul, I. So we have to match dollar for dollar every dollar that we receive from the National Endowment for the Arts. So we have an annual process that we go through with the NEA to apply for partnership funds. We expect in our next grant to receive close to $935,000. And so over the years, we have become very creative in how we make that match because our general fund allocation has been historically very low. We count our general fund allocation we also manage the state's percent for art program, and that is a program that ebbs and flows depending on uh, um, construction of new state buildings or renovations. Uh, so we would use whatever we get that year um, in projects toward the match. We also count the Moose Plate Arts Conservation Grant funds that we receive toward the match. And so um, by requesting an increase in our state grants line in this budget, we will be able to comfortably make our match without having to rely on revenue sources that are not consistent. Follow up, yeah. So you said make your match. Does that mean there's a maximum amount that could be matched? Yes, we have to match our federal grant dollar for dollar. So if we receive $935,000 from the NEA in a particular year, we have to match that with state funds. No, that's not my, my, my question is, suppose we spent $2 million, would the Fed send us $2 million or no. not? No, <laughs> okay. Unfortunately not. <laughs> so so our, our amount is, is exactly 935,000, yes? That's the amount that we have to match. We would gratefully accept more funds from the state <laughs> for us no, to be able to grant out into the community. All right. So my question is, if we gave you a million, would they match a million? No. No. That's a, it's exactly that. Yeah. All right. And if we gave you 500,000, they would give you 500,000. Yes? Um, no. 
No, oh. it really works the other, it's the other way around. So the National Endowment for the Arts makes a determination based on a formula that they use to grant funds to state arts agencies. And then is it, up, it is up to the state to match whatever we get from the federal government. So are you saying it's either 935,000 or zero? No, we actually, in the years that we were completely unable to make the match, we applied for waivers with the National Endowment for the Arts to be able to be able to continue to receive that federal money. But uh, if I may, please. Also, what Ginny is um, expressing is if we don't, if we know we're not going to get nine hundred thirty-five thousand dollars from the general fund, we then we then ca account for the Moose Plate Fund, the percent for arts, which is an RSA that says if the state builds a new public building. One half of one half. Of one half of one percent of that cost goes into um, uh, uh, going out to bid to local artists to come up with a piece of artwork for that building. That allocation can be counted as part of the match, but we can't predict that number every year. So it's that's where the creativity comes. We try really hard to match match it dollar for dollar. If we can't, then we're sh shorting ourselves okay. from na national funds. I see. Yeah. So. Well, we're about to build a, a $25 million parking garage. That's $250,000 in percent here. All right. Yeah. So, <laughs> all right, let, let's try again. So is, does the 935000 is that 2023's number? Is it the biennium's number? That what was it last biennium? So we, we, we are expecting an increase of about $112,000 for federal fiscal year 23, which will support our fiscal year 24 activities. Okay. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> you want to ask about the tram? Right yeah, I, at some point. Yeah, let me let me just quick. All right. So this this uh, public television thing. Um, that's asking for 2.7 million. No, no. No, that the the two point seven million is what historically the state allocated to PBS through UNH. That was cut off in twenty eleven. In twenty eleven, so they have not received any state funding since twenty eleven. Right. So they have asked um, for is it I think five hundred five hundred thousand dollars per year twenty twenty four and five hundred thousand dollars twenty twenty five to come to them from the state through the Council on the Arts, which is where we can then count 500,000 in 2024 and 500,000 in 2025 to match the federal money, which is a huge relief because we can benefit from that match. Well, it doesn't sound that way to me, but anyway, all right. Why don't we go to the tramway? <laughs> you want to stay for the tramway? Yeah, all right. So. Uh, there's a bill to spend $25 million um, for improving the tramway or something mm -hmm. for operations. What's the situation there and and uh, how has maintenance, is, is this a problem that maintenance was not adequate over time? No, 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 is no, no, no. Something like that? So I'll give my uh, brief remarks and then I'll ask um, Director Wilson to help me. Um, and I apologize, we had a fact sheet that um, we presented at the hearing, SB 55 hearing, and I didn't even think to bring it today. Uh, but I can email it out, and it's on our website. So, in 1934, <laughs> uh, <laughs> the um, state legislature um, ag agreed that the tram would be uh, a, a magnificent uh, tourist attraction in New Hampshire and uh, supported funding the tram and it was built um, which really kicked off um, summer tourism as well as supporting the ski industry um, in Franconia Notch State Park. Fast forward to 1977 when they realized they needed to re the, that tram's lifespan was over again went to the legislature again they supported it and in 1980 uh, the tram 2 which you can ride today was established with a 40 year life expectancy. We're now at 43 years. Um, starting two years ago, we started bringing this need um, forward in our capital discussions. 
um, so that it wouldn't be a sudden need. We, we would have time to do some studies. Um, and we have, um, so we have spoken at length to the, uh, the company that uh, manages the equipments, Doppelmeyer, which is fun to say. Um, and they warn us that while the tram is safe right now, and we check it every day, um, the parts are so antiquated that when they break, we're not going to be able to find replacement parts. So we have confidence that the tram is going to run just fine this, this season, the summer season, which brings us $2 million in revenue for the state park system. Um, and we want to be able to, um, well, we're asking the legislature to decide, is this something that New Hampshire wants to invest in again? Um, and if so, um, working with DAS and their D Division of Public Works, the ballpark number that they put forward is $25 million. Um, and that's where we're turning for help to decipher where does that come from. We brought it before Gopher for ARPA funds. We've brought it to the capital budget just by saying, we don't know where this, where you want to allocate these funds from. Um, and so where we are today is at a decision point where we hit the 85th anniversary of the tram this summer. Um, and we would like clarity on where we're going to go for the next 45 years with the tram. Thank you. Further questions? Sure. So um, if, if the tram was, was uh, discontinued, mm -hmm. Does that end skiing at Cannon altogether? Absolutely not. Oh, okay. So Cannon Mountain, which is part of Franconia Notch State Park, runs the tram in the wintertime maybe three days a week. It mm. supplements the skiing. It's another place for skiers to find adventure. All those trails can be accessed by other lifts as well. Um, the, tram, the tram's busy season and where we gain the revenue is in the spring, summer, and fall, where we have busloads of of tourists and um, and people who you know go to the bed and breakfast and say, what should we do today? Mm -hmm. How much revenue does the tram bring in per year? Two point something million a year. Okay. So that seems reasonable to continue. Now, to me, this sounds like a capital budget obvious mm -hmm. sort of thing. Have have you gone to the Public Works Committee and they turned you down? Is that what's So going on? the capital budget is only a certain amount every year, right? They have 120 million to spend. Yes. So they were hoping that there was another magic bullet. <laughs> All right, thank you. Twenty five million seems to be like the <laughs> number that we've heard on it's a the lot of projects. Yeah. <laughs> So further questions of the commissioner? I, I have a few. Good. So you mentioned a number of new positions. I didn't tally them all up. How many folks are you looking to add to the department? So <clears throat> the three new full-time positions I, that I um, described for the commissioner's office um, are, we can abolish three positions for those three. Um, the nine T's that we would want to um, change over to full time uh, would be counted as additional, I guess, even though they already are people, but we want to make them full time. Um, and then there are two uh, Division of Forest and Lands new positions and one arts position. So all things being equal, it's three new positions above and beyond what we currently have. Okay. So Representative Murray had a question she asked me to ask you, and that's on the mansion over in Newcastle. The what in Newcastle? The, the old governor's mansion? Or oh, yeah. How, I guess there was some activity planned last year to do some renovation, and she was just kind of curious where everything stood and if you need additional funding for upgrade and so this so is the Wentworth Coolidge mansion yep. um, if you haven't been you must go it's amazing uh, we just did some work um, in interior work uh, to replace the historic wallpaper um, which uh, which was a ma major and impressive overhaul of that uh, room and experience I'm, I'm looking at Brian <laughs> Wilson who's our historic um, expert in the room to see if he has specific updates on other projects Come on, Ben, you can do this. The other 
Um, so the Wentworth Coolidge Mansion, um, the billiards room, as it's known, uh, just had uh, its wallpaper um, uh, redone. It was a room where actually um, uh, silverfish will eat paper. They, they like um, cellulose. And um, that entire room of 18th century wallpaper was eaten over the last um, last 50 years. And so that room um, was completely done. Um, the floor, all the painting, the wallpaper, plaster work. Uh, there is other work going on right now, which is the repair of the seawall, which uh, protects the easternmost uh, side of the uh, foundation to the building. And then there's other work planned um, that will come out of a, a historic structures report that's being done, I believe, this spring. And that is to look at all of the interior um, deal with uh, moisture issues, um, uh, uh, freshen up the paint on the interior, as well as do some other um, wallpaper conservation work. Um, it still has its original uh, 18th century uh, flocked wallpaper in two rooms, which is, um, I think there are four rooms in America that still have these, um, these papers on them, and, and we own one of them. Thank you. Not just for him, uh, not specific. What is a tax credit project? Uh, so um, through the National Park Service, if um, you were to buy a historic building down on Main Street here, um, or even this building, um, <laughs> and you wanted to put it into uh, commercial use, you can apply through our office um, uh, for a historic 20% uh, historic uh, tax credit. Um, so um, uh, it's a it's a very popular program amongst developers who want to retain um, the historic nature of a building, but also um, make it useful today and um, add the modern amenities and that sort of thing. So we work in consultation with the developer and the architects um, to make that happen. Is that twenty percent of the purchase price of the building, or the the amount the work done to fix it up? Of or? the appraised value after the work is done. Oh, I see. And is it sort of automatic that? Uh, it uh, it yes, it can be. Um, it's a it's a lengthy. I assume you did the work correctly, and you, that sort of and, stuff, and right? that's why we work very closely um, with uh, with the folks doing the work and and how what the scope is and that sort of thing. And then we send off all of that information to the Park Service, and they actually do the approvals, the final approvals. But Thank it's a very popular project or Thank program. Yeah. Representative Thanks. McGuire is our resident engineer, which. <laughs> So it's a different very kind thorough. Of yeah, very thorough. <laughs> Thank you very much. So uh, I guess I have a couple of questions on the Bureau of Trails. Ooh. So the division has been actually wrestling with an issue over in Derry. Um, it's the trail, the rail trail that runs from Salem to Manchester and this little stub that's um, lacking connectivity, I guess, would be the right word. And there's a uh, rather a contentious issue between the town and the rail trail people and the bicyclists. Mm -hmm. And I'm asking you this question because the commissioner uh, got involved with a very contentious issue in Peterborough where we had uh, issues with the DOT, the PUC, and Eversource. And it took about five years, right, mm -hmm. that we got all the people together and came up with a solution that everybody was happy with, mm -hmm. which was amazing. And I got to give Sarah a lot of credit because at uh, the initial stage, we were told that the her department had no say so really in the issue. It was a PUC DOT issue, and when it came around, Sarah stepped up. We have people involved with the um, trails people in the area, mm -hmm. and uh, it worked out well. So, how do you, as far as managing these state owned trails mm -hmm. is the trail from manchester to salem is that i know some of it's owned by the state or how does that all work as far as your agency and the trails bureau managing these trails it is so complicated oh here we go <laughs> um <clears throat> i can't speak specifically to the salem manchester one but what i can say is what you described illustrates a common 
challenge around the state. Uh, the good news is there are a lot of people that value our trail system, right? For a variety of reasons. And we should have room for everybody. We should have room for people who want to walk their dog and people who want to ride their fat bikes in the winter and people who want to ride their machines. Um, so we have the Bureau of Trails that is within the Division of Parks and Recreation. Um, and that bureau is, I'll be honest, mostly focused on motorized vehicle trails because that's where their funding comes from, registrations from snowmobiles and ATVs. We have decided as a department that we need to pay out of a parks fund uh, for a full-time employee to help manage the non-motorized activity on our trails because currently there is not a, a a phone number at a desk where non-motorized constituents feel like they have an advocate in the state agency. We work with them closely. We partner with them. They're they're represented on our um, state uh, you know committees of advisors for the trails, et cetera. But but it's it's getting busy out there and more complicated. We work very closely with DOT because they do have a lot of jurisdiction over the rail trails that you articulated. And they have invested a lot of time and hired a consulting firm to come up with a vision for rail trail development throughout the state. And our staff is working um, in concert with that. That's a long-term plan. Um, a lot of these um, challenges are just sort of whack-a-mole right now, to try to figure out how we can find solutions that work for local constituents. Um, and sometimes it works out fine, and sometimes it's more, it's more complicated. Um, one of the requests that we put forth for ARPA funds, and it was approved, and now we're working through the process of making our dream come true, is um, uh, creating a um, GIS mapping tool for state agencies and municipalities, decision makers to be all on the same page when we're having conversations about trails. Right now, there is not a comprehensive current online mapping tool for all of the trails in New Hampshire. And we need to make decisions um, in real time based on safety if a trail's washed out and you know, fish and game needs to know that we have to close this part of the trail. We also have to make decisions based on private landowner rights state issues, conservation easements. And so having one comprehensive color-coded place where we can update information in real time and prioritize these types of conversations will be a game changer, I think, for the trails system in New Hampshire. Um, in the meantime, like I said, it is complicated and we're having a lot of one-off conversations. Representative Hatch followed by Representative McGuire. In terms of enforcement for the trails, mm -hmm. in terms of enforcement for the trails um, I get a lot of activity with in my district over this, and I get a lot of constituent calls mm -hmm. with people um, either confused or unsure of where they need to go for enforcement type mm -hmm. of activities and um, things they need addressed, and who do they contact? Local police, the fish and game, or whomever. And they've been told all of the above, mm -hmm. depending on the circumstance. So if we, um, as we're increasing the trails and the activity on them, has there been any effort to uh, put clarity to this or what is the appropriate uh, venue? Uh, because I've had a plethora of answers yeah. <laughs> um, inquiring about this. Uh, uh, for enforcement or even just information people yep. are having trouble finding the right person to talk to about what they should is, is there a lot of doing. this yeah, yeah exactly mm -hmm. exactly so so where does that sit i guess and thank you yeah. uh great question uh we have a wonderful working relationship with fish and game um, and it's a daily conversation between their COs who are out in the woods and our forest rangers that are also out in the woods. So in our division of forests and lands, and you see I, because of the growth of activity in, in the great outdoors, we are seeking an additional forest ranger to help because we did a, a, an informal audit um, among our forest rangers just to get an understanding of what percentage of their time is being spent on trail um, issues and they with confidence say about 20% and that's a new number for them. This wasn't usually, it's not a typical or historic um, piece of work for them. Uh, so our forest rangers and our COs are out in the woods uh, and when they can, it's, it's a lot of education. We have people renting 
v machinery and they don't realize they're on private land and they're here for a weekend and then they're going to go back. And so there's a, a real push to educate the respect for the land um, that they're recreating on and to understand that. So we're having that conversation. The CEOs are doing the best they can. I'm sure Director Mason can speak to his needs um, in terms of his, his troop. Uh, and then when it comes to towns that have agreed to allow vehicles, ATVs on their actual town roads, uh, that, comes, that comes down to their own town law. Um, abilities and some towns are recognizing I think Dummerston voted down the opportunity because they don't have law enforcement on their roads um, so it would be challenging we our forest rangers aren't on town roads pulling people over um, so we're just in the woods so may I sure. just along this um, where does the sheriff's mm -hmm. department for different counties intersect with this because there's um, I think there needs to be some clarity mm -hmm. to the subject, and I'm not sure the best way, uh, the um, best laws are well, yeah. the best method to get there, uh, we, but it is a problem. Not only do we work closely with the sheriffs, the county sheriffs, but many of the county sheriff's staff come from the Bureau of Tra Trails and Forests and, and Land staff, so we know them personally. Yeah. Um, but uh, there has there has to be sort of documented agreements and understanding of what we can supplement and what they can supplement, which is an exercise that we go through in real time. I'm looking at Pat, Director Patrick Hackley. I don't know if you want to say anything about Coas County at, at this point because he's had these conversations over the last couple months with Coas County, which you can imagine is very busy in this mm -hmm. arena. Um, sure, I, I can project in the back if you'd like to uh, you know, Unfortunately, you gotta use the mic, otherwise we can report. Um, and just your full name and what spelling, please, if you would, sir. Patrick Hackley, Director for the Division of Forests and Lands. So as Commissioner Stewart said, um, my most of my experience now in terms of uh, interaction between the sheriff, the county sheriff's office, and our rangers is, is Coas County. So we'll just use that as the, the primary example. The sheriff's office up in Coas does a, a darn good job of policing the trails. They have the bandwidth, as as commissioner said. They also have three of our retired rangers that work for their office, so they know the back roads, they know the trails, and I and I believe that the sheriff's office and their deputies have a good working relationship also with fish and game conservation officers. So there's three enforcement entities out there on the trails in the North Country. Now, as you can imagine, they're all needed because of the, the, the capacity that those trails get. They get a tremendous amount of use. So I believe our relationship is pretty solid uh, with uh, the county sheriff's office, um, but they're a needed uh, uh, enforcement agency when it comes to the trails and speeding and registrations and things like that. Um, and I'm sure that the COs for Fish and Game could say the same thing, that, that it's, it's a welcomed participation. But as of right now, we don't have any formal MOU with the Sheriff's Office. And that might be something we explore. But we have, in our fiscal year 24-25 budget, requested another ranger. And that this OHRV enforcement issue is specifically one of the reasons we're asking for to to add another ranger um so yeah um if, if you may uh, along this line is there you don't have a memorandum of understanding which i would i thought one was being developed uh, um, that goes back uh, in coas county yes a year ago i i mean but i undoubtedly was given uh I think it would be a good idea if there was, but I'm not yes. aware that one was in play. Okay. And here, here goes to my query and my concern is, is um, who's coordinating this? And that's what needs to happen. Is that something, uh, it seems like your agency has most of the problems <laughs> with, with this activity. So is this something you're coordinating? Of course, the sheriff's department thinks they. I think it's done very much so at the local level. So yeah. the sheriff, the sheriff uh, will speak with our chief. So Chief Steve Sherman, he's the head of our Forest Protection Bureau, right. and that's that's where our rangers. That's that's the the bureau that they work under. So I believe those conversations occur between the sheriff, the, the county sheriff, our chief, and then I think it's Mike Eastman. Yeah. 
Mike Eastman with the Wild. So the three of them communicate, and however they work it out. I have not heard of any particular conflicts between the agencies, but it. I think it's just good relationship housekeeping, maybe. And I'd be willing to explore an MOU if that's what you're recommending. Uh, if I, if I may, I think I think um, that might be a good opportunity. I I think that it should be explored. It's just I don't necessarily get feedback from the sheriff's department or the rangers um i get feedback from constituents and people who utilize it and and um uh, concerns about they lack direction as to what yeah is correct or what they should or shouldn't be doing sure uh, you know i mean in it my will... mind it's common sense but yeah well yeah. we would yeah. like that to prevail usually yeah. but it doesn't always yeah. especially out in the OHRV trails. Right. But um, what what area do you represent? What's your constituency? Collis County. Oh, you weren't Collis. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. well, there you go. Yeah, that. Gorm and specifically oh, okay. where a I'm lot of activity. I'm sorry, I didn't know that. Yeah. Um, okay. So that is that is the county of, of interest when it comes to HRV and snowmobile enforcement. Yeah. Um, I'm open to that. We've been working with the sheriff's office, not so much with the Fish and Wildlife because I think they have their routes that they patrol. It, it's not... Uh, just just to be clear, though, um, we do it because our, as the commissioner said, our staff is out in the woods already. That's where their enforcement jurisdiction is, particularly on DNCR lands, but also on private lands when it comes to forestry laws and wildfire prevention and suppression. So those are the two pillars of their enforcement, forestry, uh, water quality violations in partnership with DES. So if they discover logging jobs are affecting water quality, they reach out to DES. And then any any uh, wildfire activity, fire permits, etc. OHRVs has crept into their their suite of enforcement uh, duties because of the nature of the you know the explosion of that that sport, particularly in the North Country. So, um, yeah, I mean, I, I think it's probably a good idea. I'm going to be uh, presenting to the uh, the Coas County delegation. Actually, uh, you'll probably be there on the 27th on Monday, uh, the 27th. So. Um, I'm willing to explore that conversation if you think it would help. If, if, if your constituents are concerned about bad behavior on the trails, uh, yes. then then the three enforcement agencies should be talking, saying who's going to be where this weekend, that kind of thing. I think that's it makes sense. And if I may, just one more uh, concern along that venue. Um, you you take care of the registration. You're, or who takes – what Fishing agency? Game. Fish and Game takes care of the registration. So um, – what happens is there's um, OHRVs out there with not appropriate equipment on them and make noise or they don't have a proper noise um, uh, mufflers or, or whatever. So uh, fishing game is the primary source for that. Okay, good. We'll see you okay. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Mr. Fletcher. Representative McGuire. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. So on the mapping project of trails, mm -hmm. are you doing that with the granite system? Are you familiar with that? So we are um, in, uh, we've convened sort of the GIS experts from all the agencies that are using GIS to figure out what what the best, we don't want to start something new if there's a platform that we can already use. We've talked to 911, we've talked to DOT, we've talked to uh, Fish and Game. So I don't know what the current iteration of that conversation is, but we certainly aren't doing this without consultation with other state agencies to get something that will work for everybody. Yeah, because that system is fantastic. It's G-R-A-N-I-T, no E, Yeah. right? And it's got layers yep. for um, topology and roads and all this sort of stuff, and you can choose what layers you want to see at any given time, uh, I, and you could easily have a snowmobile layer yeah. and, a, and a trail layer and, you know, all that kind of thing. I'm, but, yeah. I'm with certainty, I can say that that has been a conversation. Yeah, okay, good. Now, as long as you're here, we're running out of time. Um, your agency takes in a lot of revenue, right? Mm -hmm. So can you give us the big picture kind of number of what's your revenue versus your total expenses annually? Yes. I'm just checking. We have some fancy pie charts here. Um, <clears throat> but I don't know if we have... So other funds, right? Other funds. What are other funds? Well, other funds mostly in our agency 
are the uh, revenues that we generate through parks and recreation. Um, and if you look at the pie charts, you can see DNC, our other fund source mix, parks and recreation, 80% of their funding is other funds, which means revenue. Forest and lands, um, you know, almost $5 million <clears throat> of revenue. Um, so a bulk of, of the, um, uh, well, by RSA, state parks have to be operationally self-funded. So in order to open a park, in order to clean the bathrooms, in order to hire an employee and give them a, give them a uniform, we need to um, charge at the door to get in. Um, and so our number one um, funding source, as you can imagine, uh, um, 93 state parks, only half of them we charge at. And of that half, only half make, re make a profit. So we really lean on Franconia Notch State Park for their extra revenue. We really lean on Hampton Beach for the um, parking revenue. Um, and there's other Pawtuckaway, um, other state parks that do well enough that they can chip in to support the other state parks. Um, it's our mission to be accessible. So we don't wanna have um, escalating uh, rates all the time to, um, to uh, deter a family of four from Manchester to have a wonderful park experience. We wanna be affordable and that's part of our mission. So we, we run ourselves like a business in the parks uh, department. And as I alluded to in my remarks, uh, a lot of our forests and lands, um, our, our enterprise system there is growing and we wanna capture that. What's the, yeah, thank you. What is the commissioner's office pie? What, is, what does that consist of? <laughs> I was looking at that myself. I, I run a bake sale every, you know. And <laughs> um, I'm gonna have to get back to you on that one specifically. Um, okay because I do not sell things from the right. commissioner. And then, and then this whole uh, circle is the red one to the right, right? So other so funds, the yes. other funds, and then there's federal funds and you have 14% general. Fund. Correct. Okay. Business is good. We're, we're doing a good job. Um, and we reflect uh, that in my remarks with recognizing if we want to sustain it, we need to, you know, uh, hire where, where it's strategically important. Thank you. Representative Griffin. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And thank you for taking the question. I've always, uh, I see here that we have 3,700 plus or minus archeological sites. And um, I've always wondered what, what makes a site, what is the criteria of a site to make it a- Archeological? Yeah. Oh, good question. I have a little trouble with big words. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, one of our best kept secrets is that we, this division, this department is home to our state archeologists um, and they're amazing and they have so many treasures. And as a mom of three little kids, it kills me that we're not taking these treasures and bringing them to every school in the state because it's really remarkable. Um, we, I'll let Ben speak to sp the science behind dis discerning an archeological site. Um, but, uh, you know, well, I'll just let him explain it because I'm not a scientist. A great question. Um, so you can stick a shovel anywhere in New Hampshire in the ground and come up with an archaeological site, basically. Um, but these are sites that have actually been dug um, and recorded. Um, so for instance, whenever uh, DOT does a highway widening project, um, there's an archaeological component to it, as well as above ground uh, resource component. So if there's a stone wall that has to be moved or, um, or a cellar hole, something like that. So each time uh, a project like that is taken on, it creates another site, basically. Um, there are some more important sites, um, pre-contact sites. Um, we have 12,500 years of history of uh, inhabitants uh, in New Hampshire, and um, those are more specific sites where um, it, it's somebody, an archaeologist, uh, looking um, to uh, frame the history of, of that certain group of people, how they moved around and lived, and that sort of thing. So, I, I guess I was wondering if there's a criteria, you know, so many years, or, or what the criteria is. Um, 
to um, to actually call it a, a an archaeological site? Um, you know, that's a good question. That might be above my pay grade. Um, I'm not an archaeologist, a trained archaeologist. I'm an architectural historian, um, preservationist, and uh, um, I can certainly get that information to you. Um, but archaeologists like to think that, you know, the beer can that's thrown out the car window um, could possibly be an archaeological site at some at some point. Um, so it's um, I think it's a fairly vague um, definition. Um, but uh, we spend a lot of our time um, looking at at uh, archaeology as it pertains to federally uh, funded and state funded uh, projects around the state. Representative Griffin probably has what the largest license plate collection around, and so his site might be considered an archaeological site. <laughs> Representative Ebel. Just along those lines, great to see you guys. Um, don't you have a facility where you hold some of these archa? I was trying to remember when it was deteriorating. Hmm? So um, thank you for the question. Um, so uh, we do maintain an archaeology lab, a uh, laboratory, uh, uh, and I, I won't mention where it is, but um, uh, just for safety's sake, and um, but we um, we curate all of the things that are found um, in the state from all of these projects for other agencies as well as for our own agency, and um, it's uh, vastly um, uh, under uh, well, it's overutilized, and um, and we do need more space. Um, it's our hope that um, that we'll be able to move into a, another building actually at the same location um, temporarily. Um, but um, it's it's really our dream. It's our commissioner's dream to create um, to create basically a museum for all of the things that we have. We have artwork. We have collections. We have all of our archaeology uh, bits and pieces, which are, are fascinating. And, um, and we'd like to showcase those uh, to the citizens of New Hampshire and, and our visitors. So, um, but our archaeology lab, and I'm happy to give a tour, uh, the state archaeologists would be happy to give a tour to anybody that wants to see that, that facility. Uh, it's here in Concord. Any further questions? I do have one quick question for, I think, the forester. So I've read that we've got an invasive species issue, that all sorts of uh, insects are coming and plant life. What are you doing to uh, deal with those issues? I know it's a big concern for Commissioner Jasper with agriculture, but what are you folks doing? Sure. So in your folders that we provided, there's a, a snapshot of our division and, and the different units that are under uh, the forest and lands. Uh, and one of them is called the Forest Health. It's actually not officially a bureau, but we treat it as such. It's Forest Health Program. So we have three full-time professionals in that program, and their responsibility is to do monitoring, research, and mitigation on invasive species. Um, the legislature several years ago appropriated a significant amount of funds that funded one of our entomologists on staff to specifically address the invasion of the emerald ash borer. I think everyone's pretty familiar with that by now. Where we've, we're losing or will likely lose most of our mature white ash trees in New Hampshire. Um, I, I don't want to get into that issue specifically, but we have been working on that for a number of years, introducing parasitic wasps, tiny, small in your pinky fingernail, that actually feed on the larvae of the, the emerald ash borer. And so we're releasing, and these parasitic wasps are specifically target, they, that's what they feed on. They're, they're, that's the only thing they feed on. So even though we're introducing another uh, foreign species, that's the first question people ask are we going to have problems with the wasp? But uh, what they found, the researchers did their full research before they started breeding and distributing these parasitic wasps to basically naturalize. And because the animal ash borer is here to stay, it's also naturalized. So we needed to naturalize a predator. And that was the, the purpose. And this is why we have professional entomologists that study insects, 
bug scientists, we call them sometimes, pathologists that study tree diseases. Um, and uh, you'll be pleased to know in terms of forest health that the U.S. Forest Service has granted us additional funding, which is not baked into this fiscal year 24-25 budget because we're, we're asked by the by the budget office, by DES, not to include it. But we'll have another $100,000 to apply towards forest health issues in fiscal year 24-25. And we've already come up with a game plan for that. So we, we're very actively engaged in, in the forest health invasive species issues. All right. I, I know that there was a wasp that went after gypsy moth. I don't know if that was introduced naturally or somebody brought it in, but... We had that infestation of gypsy moth several years ago, and a wasp yeah. developed to go after the eggs or something. So okay, yeah. I um, I'm not sure about a predator for gypsy moth. Now that's basically been naturalized for decades, and and we've had a spike recently of gypsy moth infestation in the Conway area. It's actually a, a very they've documented this. Our our staff has they've documented where it often is like a band that goes diagonally across the state and kind of tops out at, in Temple. New Hampshire for some reason, but um, there's a natural fungus that that um, destroys the, the larvae of the uh, the caterpillar. So when we have droughty summers, that fungus is not allowed to spread like it usually does, and so we see a spike in the gypsy moth population after some droughty summers. And that's that's what we believe. That's what our forest pathologists believe is occurring with gypsy moth right now. Fortunately, they feed mostly on oak. Oak is very resilient, and most of the feeding is done by the end of June, and oak can re-sprout a second set of leaves by the end of the summer. So, but successive defoliations, like two to three summers of, of heavy defoliation, we can lose some trees, so we're watching that. Yeah. All right, any further questions? Uh, Commissioner, yeah. great to see you. Good to see you. If I could just let you know, um, Specifically about Gorham, we're about to open a new office in Gorham. We, um, the uh, Department of Environmental Services, has a, has had a building there for a number of years. They didn't need it anymore, and they were going to sell it. And we said, "Hold on, we would love to have our imprint in Gorham because it is such a, a critical spot for not only outdoor recreation but a, a cultural assets too." So um, you'll see an invitation this summer for a grand opening of a building that everyone knows in Gorham. Um, but I'm really excited to expand our visibility and connectivity beyond Concord. And I think this is a really good opportunity. All right, seeing no further questions, but if, for our budget discussion, when you come back, could you put together the economic value of our trail system to the state's economy? I know it's significant. We heard about 160,000 people use the Salem Rail Trail, and several businesses have developed on the trail. So I'd be curious if you could put something together to give us an idea exactly what this trail system is providing economically to the state. It's probably a big chore, but you got a couple of weeks. For you, anything. We'll, we'll get that. We'll get it. All right. Thank you. Sure, I'm, Representative I'm really, Ebel. Yeah, sorry. I'm really sorry I came in late. And I just, on state parks, I know you guys really live on fees. Do you have staffing issues at parks where you could be collecting fees, but you don't have the staff to do it? Yeah, we make strategic decisions, um, not every year, but as, as patterns change and different parks are discovered on what the economic viability is of having a staff person there or not. Some of our parks where we don't have a staff person, we have an Iron Ranger where people can leave donations which we collect and, um, and that's uh, wonderful. But yeah, it's, if we had more staff, we would have more staff at parks that don't have staff. That's a short answer. I guess it, I, I, it's probably really hard to quantify, but it's one of those things where if you had more staff, you could yeah. bring in, yeah. We, you know, we're focused um, on critical positions like lifeguards. You know, it, it would be tragic if we hit the summer season at Hampton Beach and we didn't have enough lifeguards. We hire 73 lifeguards. These are very busy people, um, as you can imagine, at Hampton Beach. So right now we're recruiting those. So we put a lot of effort in recruitment and retainment um, and our primary focus on, are on some of these life safety positions. And then beyond that, um, looking at other other spots that we would love to 
to hire. I while we're talking, see how this is how quick we are. There is some um, value allocated to Trails Bureau and local clubs deliver an additional economic impact of 586 million to the state annually, and we estimate the ATV use use generates over another 500 million. In addition, third parties generate six million in revenue for their organizations through events held in state parks. I will take this number and I'll expand a little bit on it for you. Um, but we have a start. Thanks so much. We'll see you in a couple of weeks. So it's well after 11, and so uh, we're going to hear from the Liquor Commission. Are they here? I see, they're out, see them out in the hall. They're out in the hall. Okay. Yeah, and, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Coupons. <laughs> <laughs> And we have some dis distinguished guests here today. <laughs> okay. All right, thank you, Commissioner. <laughs> Please identify yourself for our clerk and get, we'll get started. You need to push the red button yeah, or the button. There we go, there okay, you go. thank yeah. you. Yeah. Chairman, members of the committee, I'm Joseph Malika. I'm the chairman of the New Hampshire Liquor Commission, and with me is Tina Demers, our CFO. So I would like to bring you through a little department overview of the Liquor Commission. So we can start on page two. Just a basic breakdown of the three-tier system. On page three, you'll see the values and attributes of the three-tier system. And that's uh, according to the NABCA, the National Alcohol Bureau of Control. Uh, that's a 2015 statement from them. We are a member, as a control state, we are a member of the NABCA. On page four, you can see the 17 control jurisdictions across the United States. After prohibition, the federal government allowed the states to make the choices whether they'd be open or control states. And at that time, New Hampshire, along with 16 other states, made the decision to be a control, <clears throat> control destination. On page five, you can see the operational overview of the commission. The high points are the Liquor Commission is self-funded. It's a separate liquor fund outside of the general fund, and no general fund appropriations are used to maintain the operations of the Liquor Commission. In 2022, the commission generated up just uh, under $722 million in sales. We can move to page six. The divisions and responsibilities of the commission. We have the Office of the Commission, the Division of Enforcement, the Division of Administration, and the Division of Marketing and Merchandising, and descriptions of each. On page seven, you can see the org organizational structure of the commission. Again, the Office of the Commission and the three divisions underneath classified and unclassified employees that are in each. The Division of Marketing 298 classified employees includes not only the folks at the HQ warehouse, but it also includes uh, our people in marketing and in the stores. Uh, may I ask, are, are, are many of those part-time? 
Uh, not of that 298. Those are full-time employees. But in general, stores have many part-time? We do. We do. Yeah, yeah, and we have a whole section toward the end okay, where we great. will Thank go you. through the full and part-time and part-time equivalent as well. Gotcha. Thank you. Thank you, Representative. So on page 8, you'll see the statutory uh, duties of the Liquor Commission. That's uh, RSA 176-3, which lays out the opportunities that the Liquor Commission takes forth every day to run a profitable business. On page 9, you look at the Division of Enforcement. They have a, a three-pronged approach, which is education first, enforcement second, and licensing as a third prong of their duties. On page 10, on the right-hand side, you'll see the 2022 calendar year, year end. We have 6,718 licensees in the United States, and you can see in the breakdown there. So those are folks from across the country and here in the States in the state and the revenue below that is uh, derived from the enforcement arm of just under 19 million dollars on page 11 on the left hand side you'll see the educational efforts of the enforcement division the public awareness and education on the left and the licensing educational programs on the right and a breakdown of each and everything that we do to make the public aware of what we're doing and the licensees trained and as to what we're doing. On page 12, you'll see the 2022, I'm Commission, sorry. there was a question. Sure, I'm uh, sorry. Representative Griffin. Sorry, Representative. Thank you, Mr. Thank you. Chair, and thank you for taking the question. Um, I need you to go back to page 10 for a minute. Sure. Did you say that that number was in state or is that us wide that's us wide because we do allow direct shippers in new hampshire we're one of eight states that allows the shipping of uh, alcohol and wines into the state uh, and i'm sorry we're one of eight states that allows the alcohol and wine and there's 13 states that allow wine and beer so as you can see under direct shippers on the third bullet down we have 1444 licensees that ship from but out. these are all new hampshire licenses no sir these licenses the direct shipper licenses are licensees from outside the state of new hampshire but but the license allows them to sell in state. that that's correct yes sir yeah so if they have a website on their liquor store in in florida we allow them to ship their product here into the state thank you then the number looked low for a u.s wide thing okay and, and sure I, I was assuming that those were New Hampshire licenses that allowed people to come in and sell in this state. Yes, sir. Thank you for answering. Thank you, Representative. Thank you for the question. Representative McGuire. Thank you. Uh, just a related question. Is, um, I knew that was a long time for wineries. Is alcohol new to allow people to ship, or has that always been? No, alcohol, since that direct shipper's license was a, uh, was given out that that's allowed alcohol has been allowed i see there Thank is you. some uh some d defined rec requirements that allow people to ship they can't sell it into the state less than they can sell it that then we sell it and they can't uh th there's a there's a level of how much they can sell from a gallonage standpoint i see so so there's no incentive to buy I don't know, Jack Daniels or something no. via direct ship instead of in the exactly. store, right? Yeah. Exactly. Okay. Thank you. This was put out there for their small boutique wineries across the country, especially in California, Washington, Oregon, that may only have an acre of grapes and they may produce three or 400 cases a year. We didn't want, we did not want our consumers to not have the availability to those products. So we allow them to ship them into the state. Thank you, sir. So uh, we'll move on to, to uh, page 12, and just the 2022 trainings that were done in the state. On the left-hand side, you can see the Liquor Commission trained 4,700 people with uh, the live classes, and in 2022 public awareness events, there was 67 events held statewide, and we trained just a little over 113,000 people at those. 
So education and awareness is a very important piece of what the enforcement division does. Next, we can move on to page 13, which is the Division of Administration and Management. Uh, you can see that's under our COO, James Vera, and, and his responsibilities of DOIT, or Managed Information Systems, Human Resources, our HR department, and finan financial management, which is everything that consumes uh, our transactions of product in the state, outside of the state, and the moving and paying of those products. On page 14, you'll see the Division of Marketing and Merchandising. And again, on the left-hand side, their marketing goals by bullet. And on the right-hand side, the responsibilities that fall under uh, Lori Piper, who is the Director of Marketing for the Liquor Commission. On page 15, You'll see the retail outlet locations across the state. We have nine state-owned, 59 leased, and we have 27 outlets with in-store and curbside pickup, Some, a program that we came up with during COVID in September of 2020, uh, and that has garnered the state with $7.6 million in sales since 2020. On page 16, you'll see the state-owned only outlets, and at the bottom, You'll see that those outlets have brought in just over $164 million, and 27% of our total sales are done in the locations that we actually own the property. On page 17, you'll see on the left, the top 15 stores of the Liquor Commission bring in 51% of the revenue, and all other stores bring in 49% of the revenue with a tally of the ranking stores 1 to 15 on the right-hand side. On page 18, uh, just a quick listing of our three agency stores. Uh, there's one in Greenville, there's one in Pittsburgh, and there's one in Errol. Uh, and the revenue that they bring in, just a little under $2.5 million. And just a quick note there in the asterisk that Errol is... Uh, being rebuilt at this point because there was a fire two years ago and they should be up and running again by April, we're being told. I do have a quick question, Commissioner. Sure, sure. Sure. I was in West Chesterfield a couple of weeks back with my wife and I noticed large volumes of, um, well, there are several vans loading alcohol in the back. There's no prohibition to the amount of alcohol you can buy at a store, right? It's not unlimited or... It, or cash restricted or anything like that. No, it's not. And we actually had a letter written to us through DOJ from the IRS that explains that we have no limit of cash and we have no limit of product. Okay. The, the, the state of New Hampshire is not breaking any laws when we sell the product. The individual who buys the product, when they go back into their state, they have to claim the tax in their state. But our selling of the product... Uh, you know, as again, according to the IRS and according to DOJ, we are breaking no laws in doing that. Okay. Either state and or federal. Question, Representative Ebel? Um, so as far as your retail outlet um, and state owned, are you consolidating or are you expanding the number of outlets or have those stayed about the same or just think about staffing and all that kind of stuff? Well, there's, there's, and we'll get into some of this. Okay, in the, that's fine. But there is, you know, obviously we have a concern of staffing, and we have, we have less outlets now than we did 10 years ago, but we actually have more square footage. So the consolidations have taken the smaller stores, and we've opened fewer, larger locations, mainly to make sure that the consumers, when they come here, they can recognize and purchase the birth of products that we have available because there's very few liquor outlets in the United States that have the amount of skews of wine and spirits that we have. You're welcome. Representative McGuire. Thank you. So as opposed to state owned, that just means you lease in certain places? That's correct. Okay. Yes. Great. Yeah. Thank you. So on page 19, you'll look at the web and e-commerce. Uh, just under the orange balloon there, you can see that we get about 125,000 visitors a month to our website. And uh, we have 200,000 recipients of our monthly email. 
and we gained 25,000 additional subscribers in 2022. And on the right-hand side, again, you'll notice that since 2020, the curbside and in-store pickup revenue is $7.6 million. On page 20, you'll just see some of the monthly flyers and collaboration. Uh, the monthly flyers are a big way. There's a lot of celebrity products today, a lot of, a lot of interest in high-end wines and spirits. So our monthly flyer, which is called Voila, comes out on a monthly basis. <laughs> And then we have our sales, our monthly sales, which everybody has come to know and love, the 15% off, 12 bottles or more, mix or match. And then some of the display work that's been done in our outlets, including uh, products to go, chilled products to go in some locations, many locations. On page 21, you'll see our Keep It Local support, a branding that we've partnered with, New Hampshire Wine and Spirits, to give the, our consumers a 20% discount on three bottles or more of New Hampshire made products. So that is a great program and want, runs well. And on the right hand side, you'll see our Google, Google reviews that 91% of our reviews are four and five star rating. And we had about 2,500 reviews last year. On page 22, You'll see just quickly some of the outlet changes that we've made. We've re relocated or constructed 40 new outlets in 35 communities, a lot of them rehabilitations and consolidations. Uh, this year alone, we opened a new outlet in Ringe. Uh, we opened a new outlet in Manchester on Gold Street, and we opened a new outlet at Exit 17 in Concord. And uh, just if there's any questions on the bottom uh, bullet, that's our 95 Hampton southbound, northbound and southbound rehabilitation. We have an appropriation for that. Uh, the Liquor Commission, uh, through statute, is allowed to uh, sell that property and redevelop those much like we did in Hooksett. Hopefully bigger and better. On page 23, I'm sorry. Well, you're very alert back there. Sorry. So I just wanted to say that mm -hmm. your locations, your rebuilds are very attractive. You know, they fit into the community. And unlike a lot of steel buildings you see going up more, but I Thank think you. a lot of people appreciate the overall look of the properties. Thank you, Representative. Yeah. We've tried to give it a New Hampshire granite timber peg, and thank you. Yeah, yeah, we have a very nice new one a mile from my house. So <laughs> great. Um, <laughs> yeah, very convenient. Um, <laughs> Have you increased the minimum size of a of a new location so that you never will build one smaller than X, something like that? Most of the new ones that we're building are a minimum of around 9,000 square feet and obviously running up to 35,000 square feet, depending on where the location is. We found that 10, 11, 12,000 is around the minimum because of the amount of product that we need to fit in. We have a lot of SKUs. People, when they come to New Hampshire, they come to stock up. And that's the goal of people coming here is doing that. So we just want to make sure we have a birth of products when they get here. So so the overall average, there's probably a lot of older stores that are smaller than that 9,000, 10,000. That's correct. So, so you're kind of pushing in the bigger direction. Absolutely. Yes. Okay, great. Thank you. So you'll see on page 23, the Ringe uh, relocation. And the sales increase, you can see the sales, uh, the square footage increase from 5,100 to 10,000 square feet and the 22% sales increase in that location since we've moved it in May of 2022. Uh, the Concord outlet, which is the new one on exit 17, uh, we went from 4,000 square feet over on uh, the plaza with Lowe's and Market Basket in downtown. Uh, we have a minimal increase at this point of 2%, but the plaza is not completed yet. The market basket is now open, and we're, uh, we're looking forward to the restaurants and other uh, like-minded retailers that will open there. On Manchester and Gold Street, uh, number, store 31, that's a new location. Uh, Year-to-date sales are $3.3 million, and obviously right there we're next to the busiest Walmart in New England, uh, so we're, we're 
generating a lot of traffic with between Walmart and Hannaford. On page 26, you can see the major reason why the, uh, the importance of doing what we're doing, building a brand and building larger, more impactful stores. Uh, Governor Patrick in 2011 signed a bill increasing the amount of liquor licenses that one licensee could hold in the state of New Hampshire, uh, state of Massachusetts. So, and they're up to nine in 2020, and there's word that they'll be increasing that again from nine to 11. 50% uh, of our sales uh, come from out of state sales. So, cross border sales, 50% of our gross sales number. We are now uh, in competition with the largest independent retailer in the United States, which is Total Wine and Spirits. They're out of Bethesda, Maryland. Um, on page 27, you can see they have 245 stores in 27 states. We do about $5 billion in business. They have 11,000 employees. Since 2016, they have built six stores in New Hampshire, east of the 495 belt and they plan on two more in 2023, along with Market Basket, which is now into a, a, a MB Liquors, they're calling it. They have two or three in Maine. They have two or three in Massachusetts. They're opening four more in Massachusetts. Uh, they're opening two more Costco's and one more BJ's in the state. So you can see that the big box retailers have come to do business in New England and uh, Total has stores in Connecticut as well, but Massachusetts has kind of uh, put out the welcome sign to uh, alcohol retailers to come and uh, generously compete against the Liquor Commission, and quite frankly, that's why Total's here. So they're here to do business with us, and we're still doing very well. Yes, Representative McGuire. How do prices compare to the consumer here in New Hampshire compared to these stores after tax and all that? Uh, well, Massachusetts did a couple of different things when they signed that bill. They repealed their alcohol tax at the same time. Mm. So they were clearly uh, <laughs> square on. Uh, the target was New Hampshire. Mm. So they repealed their alcohol tax, and uh, they, they did give some incentives for people coming to the state. Uh, our prices are very competitive, especially on name brand products. Uh, Total Wine is a private label retailer, so they have uh, knockoff products of pretty much everything that they do across the board. So they have a knockoff of Tito's, a knockoff of Jack Daniels, a knockoff of Kendall Jackson, et cetera, et cetera. Their marketing plan is to lure you in with low prices, but they don't have the product there where we'll have six or 700 cases of Captain Morgan's in a large chore, they'll have six. And they may, they may match us or undercut us by a dollar, but the people that go in to buy the product, the product isn't there to buy. And they uh, are making very little on the name brand products. We're an outlet. We're all about name brand products. And their Chardonnay, that's their own private label, they have six to 12 labels that come out of one spigot of Chardonnay. So... <laughs> They, and they do that across the board. I mean, it's widely known uh, what they do and how they do business in the industry. Thank you. Now, is Total Wine, are they a publicly traded or a private company? They're owned by two brothers, two uh, brothers. Paul and David Trone. And David Trone is a congressman in the 15th District in Maryland. He was oh, just interesting. Interesting. Just yeah. elected. He's in his second term. Thanks. Thank you. So you'll see on page, you'll see on page 28, our HB2 Liquor Commission request. In 2011, uh, Governor Lynch uh, approved and was into HB2, an incentive program for the Liquor Commission. It's something uh, you know that I've written and we never used. Uh, we felt that at this time, given the uh, pay dis, dis, the difference in pay between what private retailers are paying and what the state is paying, that it was time to enact this retail incentive program. I did send three or four different uh, variations of the program to Governor Sununu. Uh, he approved one. We are seeing this go into uh, 
HB2 this year. And basically the program has approved and has been approved, as I said, since 2011. But the language on page 29 is what we're really looking to see. That we're out of the additional profits that are being made, the Liquor Commission will fund this program. So 10% of the profits, additional profits, will be paid to the employees via, uh, in, via an incentive bonus. So we've broken it down by the seven areas in the state, the seven supervisor areas. And at this point, we started the program in January and we're just looking to have this language put in so we can pay those employees that uh, incentive bonus. Representative McGuire. Thank you. So currently, does, do any employees work on commission in any way? No, no representative, they don't. Okay. And so with this program, the more they sell, the, the better they'll, they'll, they'll get some kind of a, a bonus? How does that work? They, anything, any increase in sales per area. So we have seven supervisor areas. So if let's say area seven, which is up north, increases sales by a million dollars in that area, 10% of that increase will go to the employees in that area only to give it an incentive. So it creates a little competition in the stores and it also cr increases employee salaries. Uh, mm -hmm. We, and I just have to be frank, our, our employees in our retail outlets are grossly underpaid compared mm -hmm. to private retailers in the state of New Hampshire. Mm -hmm. I mean, McDonald's in Claremont the other day when I went by was $18 an hour, uh, a free meal with mm -hmm. each shift, $2,500 incentive for education, mm -hmm. uh, work today, get paid tomorrow. Mm. So we're way behind the we're we're behind the eight ball on that, and we're just trying to let our employees know that we we recognize it, we understand it, we're concerned about it, and we're doing something about it. How about in the benefits area? I think the benefits are are as far as part time employees, we have no benefits for our mm. part time employees. Our full time employees are are well taken care of, in in my humble opinion. Okay. Part time rate is under fourteen dollars. The, the part-time rate starting rate is twelve dollars and sixty-three cents an hour. I see. Yeah, yeah. that's not great. And no. so, uh, so this uh, incentive is kind of a team concept rather than you sell, you do something for personal. That's correct. Or even by a store. No, right? it's yeah, it's yeah. from top to bottom. Any employee, be it full time or part time, that works more than twenty-one hours a week. Uh, Mm. 21 hours a week will be involved in the incentive program. Mm. And one of the things that Tina will get into is what we've seen over the years, our part-time employees used to bump up against that 28 hour window all the time. Our part-time employees are now working 15 hours or a, a mm. week or less. So we need to incentivize them to make us their primary part-time employer. Mm. So mm. if they are working for three different people, mm. I'll take that extra shift a week at the liquor commission to get to my 21 hours so I can enjoy part of that bonus. Great. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. So at this point, thank you very much for your questions. Uh, I'll turn it over to Tina to take you through uh, the rest of the program. Thank you. Good morning. So on page 30, what we have is our full-time and our part-time positions. So you'll see in the upper left corner, it's our authorized full-time positions, both filled and vacant with our vacancy rate. And you'll see that this year to date, we have the highest vacancy rate at 12%. We're currently recruiting for 40 positions with the majority of those positions being in the stores. Full-time, yeah. The second chart is um, full-time equivalent based on part-time hours worked. And as you can see, we are down to 285 full-time equivalent. So for a comparison, in 21, we were when we had record sales year, we had 312 filled full-time positions and 358 part-time full-time equivalent for a total of 670 full-time equivalent. Currently, we have 303 
filled full-time positions and 285 part-time full-time equivalent for a total of 588 full-time equivalent, which is a difference of 82 full-time equivalent. And this reduction in position is the reason why, you know, store hours have been reduced, why we've had to close stores and sales have been impacted because we don't have the people. Um, historically, the outlets have been supported by a fairly even mix of full-time and part-time staff. However, with the current trend of part-timers working the less hours, we found the need to request the additional full-time positions in our 24-25 budget to offset the decline in those part-time hours. Okay. So on page 31, this is our sales expense and revenue tre trends for FY20 to 22, and then the estimates for 23, 24, and 25 as we've provided in our budget request. This is just to show how our budget supports our sales and our revenues. And there are two RSAs that are listed on the bottom of the page. The first um, transfer requirement is under RSA 176.16, and this is calculated into our plan since it's the 5% of our prior year's gross profit. And this is identified on line uh, seven in the table. And then there's RSA 126 AA colon three. And this is not in our revenue plan because it's the additional funds requested by HHS. And that's line nine on the table. And as identified as the granted advantage. Um, the monthly revenue focus produced by DAS reports the actual transfer that's on line 10, but this is not a true comparison to our plan because um, they do it at the reduction of the additional funds transferred to HHS. Uh, we also think it's important to mention that we are on target for this year's revenue plan, which is notable in this ever-changing and unpredictable national economy, especially since the current year plan was created two years ago. So we'll move on to page 32 for our revenue breakdown. So there are three main revenue categories that are listed and on slide 33, there's a chart that has a five year history. The categories are beer tax and permits, which is 30 cents a gallon sold or, or transferred for retail sales or to the public for authorized licensees, liquor and wine revenue, this is the sale of wine and spirits and accessories um, through our outlets and our warehouses to retail customers and on-premise licensees, which are restaurants and lounges, and off-premise licensees, which are the grocery stores and the convenience stores. And then we have another revenue source, which is primarily the licensing fees, but it also includes the direct shipping permits and lottery and other miscellaneous revenue. So moving on to page 34. This is a chart of the five-year history of revenue and expenses. And the line in the middle is the net revenue transferred annually. Um, we've gone from 157.4 million in 2018 to 165.4 million in FY22. And our operating expense ratio is consistent around 30 to 32%. On page 35, is the budget broken down by division for FY22 and our FY23 adjusted authorized, and then the FY24 and 25 budget requests. And as you can see, um, marketing and merchandising, uh, which includes the outlets, is the majority of our budget. And then next you have finance, enforcement, office of the commission, and then workers comp and unemployment comp. On page 36 is a graph of the five-year transfer history and the estimates for 23 to 25. And broken down by the two RSAs governing our revenue transfers. First, you'll see is the alcohol fund um, started out at 6.8 million in 18 and uh, increased to 11.5 million for FY23, which we've already transferred. Uh, and then you have the next, which is the granted advantage that started in FY21. It was 8.2 million, and this year we've already transferred 7.2 million. Then the next is the beer tax, which is consistent around the 13 million. And the last is the remaining net revenue from uh, liquor operations. And then on slide 37. Representative Ebel has oh, a sorry. question. Quick question. So, sure. so there's a... 
beer tax. So what about places like Hannaford that sell wine? Is there how does is there a tax on the wine or? No, they a... they purchase it from us through the warehouse. Oh. The tax on beer representative is a gallonage tax. So oh, manu wow. from from the distributors. Okay, thank you. And then on page 37 is our FY22 sales broken down by customer and category type. So spirits, wine, and accessories. And this is just so you can see where our sales come from. Our retail sale, uh, spirits were three, 383 million or 50% of our business. Retail wine, 173 million or 22.6% of our business. And in total, retail accounts for 72.7% of our business. And then you can see the breakdown for the other categories on the pie charts. I had a quick question. Sure. Going back, I think Ringe had a, what, 22% increase in sales. So it led me to start thinking, is it better for you... I know it's probably too broad a question, but to own the stores or to lease stores, what's been your historical find as far as owning versus leasing? Well, originally, uh, when I first started at the commission, uh, in, in to this day, we would need to get an appropriation to build. We'd have to borrow the money, we'd have to bond the money, and with the cost of materials and equipment today, we're clearly better leasing than we are building because of the costs of, of, of anything, a two by four, or a wiring, anything that has to do with building components is ridiculous. And one of the things that we've done over the years is our outlay of cash in a lease proposition is, is very minimal because we partner with our landlords in the first 10 years of the lease. So uh, a lease with Market Basket, Bricksmore, or whoever our, our, our landlord is, we go to them and say, this is what it costs us to build this building. This is what it will cost us to build this building. We're going to add that cost into the additional square footage for the first 10 years of the lease. So our outlay is min zero to minimal, and it's spread out over the first 10 years of the lease and then drops off. So not only do we get a favorable rate from landlords because we're the driver of traffic into the plaza, we're not having the outlay of, of state cash hurting state coffers. We're paying for between 350 and 550 an additional square footage for the first 10 years, and then that drops off. Most of the leases at this point are... 20 to 25 year leases. And we found that that's the best way to do it for us because it keeps our cash flowing for the business. We don't need an appropriation. We don't have to pay the bonding and interest. Representative Hatch. Thank you. So the 350, 550, is that your square footage? Oh, that, that's the additional dollars per square foot that will be for the first 10 years of the lease representative. Uh, you used to pay me like five dollars a square foot up in Berlin years ago. Yeah. That was pathetic. Yeah. <laughs> I threw me out after. I wholeheartedly years, agree. So, <laughs> so, thank you. So Representative, Evil. I guess I just never thought of it this way. So, like a Hannaford's or a Market Basket, if they're selling wine, since you folks are the ones that sell wine in the state, they're buying their wine from you. Correct. We are the, in, in the state of New Hampshire, we are the retailer on our end, but we're also the wholesaler to licensees on premise, which is restaurants and lounges and, and, any, and anybody else that has that type of license. And then we are the wholesaler to uh, the off-premise licensees, which are the Market Baskets, Hannaford's, Shaw's, et cetera. They buy our product from them. Uh, they buy our product from us, and every month we came out. We come out with a special flyer of deals for them to buy in. So when we get a, a a great price on something, we pass that price along to them. So, thank you. What are the relative prices um, between the three groups: the r retail store, the on-premise, and the off-premise? The 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 relative prices of the product, you know, uh, Kendall Jackson. Sure. 
right? You sell it in your store for one price, you sell it to the uh, to the um, off premise for another price, and to the on premise for some other price, right? Well, so. the, the the prices are relatively close, and what we found, and what is beneficial to our business partners is when someone is at their store and they're doing their grocery shopping, it's the convenience. So mm. if they're there and they need one bottle of wine, they'll buy that one bottle and pay the dollar more rather than, you know, go into another store. If, mm -hmm. if the, we find the consumers, if they're not going to bulk buy, mm -hmm. uh, they, they tend to pick up while they're shopping if it's just one bottle. Mm -hmm. So our goal is to get them to come in and cupboard, shall we say. You only I, have to drive a mile. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> if you only have to drive a mile, we have better prices. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So, but I guess my point was, do you sell to Hannaford less per bottle than you sell to the consumer, or no, is it all the same? It's all the same. And actually, the licensees get a 10% discount if they buy through the warehouse as well. So a licensee, a restaurant, they can, they can either have the product shipped to them and pay for the shipping, or they can pick it up in bow, which hundreds of licensees do, and get the 10% discount off of, off of the shelf. Or they can go into the stores and take advantage of our sales, which a lot of licensees do, smaller licensees do as well. Great. Thank you very much. You're welcome. So we'll just see on page 38 that we've uh, contributed uh, 3.5 million with nonprofits across the state, just briefly. And we, we uh, partner with our suppliers, worldwide national suppliers and local brokers to make those donations. And then on page 39 and 40 and 41, just some of the awards that the Liquor Commission has won and some of the accolades we've been given uh, locally and nationally. We're very, uh, we have a very competitive team and we're very grateful for the recognition uh, that people like what we're doing. So we're very grateful for that. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any further questions for the Liquor Commission? Representative McGuire. Yeah. Let me ask about, is there any sort of substitution effect between liquor and marijuana? Because all of our surrounding states now <laughs> have um mar recreational marijuana we don't right mm -hmm. have sales dropped in some way because when that started uh no but in in monitoring those sales what we notice is much like people from out of state come to new hampshire to buy their liquor people from new hampshire are going to maine vermont and massachusetts to buy their cannabis products so in our research uh those are the, uh, the New Hampshire license plates are in the three states that are surrounding us. It has not, we have not seen an effect on alcohol sales per se, but we have recognized that consumers of cannabis in New Hampshire are visiting other states to buy their product. So therefore you think if New Hampshire joined these other states as far as cannabis goes, you don't think your business would be affected very much? Well, I certainly think if we had those consumers, if we took the same model with alcohol, with cannabis that we do with alcohol, and we were hyper competitive mm. and or better priced, mm. I think that we would drive some of those consumers that come here to buy alcohol to buy cannabis while they were here. Obviously, we always look at what are consumers doing when they're here? They're coming to recreate, four-wheeling, the ocean, the mountains, so they're buying gas, they're paying rooms and meals tax, they're helping all our small businesses by, you know, renting and, and doing what they're doing. So I think there'd be some bleed over, uh, positive bleed over to mm. the state of New Hampshire. Great. Thank Just you. from a business standpoint. I understand. Thank you. Yes. <clears throat> all right. Seeing no further questions, I will recognize a, sitting in the back there, Lou D'Alessandro, Senator D'Alessandro and his wife, keeping an eye on us, Commissioner. I'm sure you. we don't pick on the Liquor Commission, I believe. Anyway, thanks so much for your presentation. I Thank guess you. we'll see you maybe next week or the week after for your next, budget next Thursday. Next Thursday, yes. All right, see you Thank then. you very Thank much. You. Thank, Thank you. you, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. Thank you very much. Day. Thank you.
<laughs> All right, we'll get this presentation together. And Commissioner, nice to see you, Commissioner Caswell. And if you could, I, I guess we're not neighbors, so we, no. you could tell us who you are and we'll get started. Welcome. So, hi, uh, good afternoon. Taylor Caswell, uh, Commissioner of the Department of Business and Economic Affairs. And this is Lori Harnois, who is the State Tourism Director, uh, who is here to talk, I think, a little bit about that angle of what we do at BEA. Um, thank you for having us today. I think it's a good opportunity to just sort of do a little bit of a reset on uh, BEA and kind of where we are and uh, in terms of organization and budget and structure and strategies for a few minutes and then sort of see what you want to talk about. But um, we're still, I guess, in the world of, of uh, state government relatively new. Uh, five years, 2017 is when BEA was established. It was, uh, it is a, uh, a two of the major divisions that previously were at what we used to call DREAD. Uh, De Department of Resource and Economic Development that came over uh, and formed the Bus Department of Business and Economic Affairs. And then we also had the Department of Natural and Cultural Resources. So the two of those were the outgrowths of that. Uh, I've been the commissioner of the department since it's uh, since it began in 2017. Um, and our mission really is uh, to, to steward the state economy and the quality of life. I mean, that's really what we bury it, we, we boil it down to. Uh, with our different organizations and divisions within the department, and I can get into a little bit about how we do that. Uh, so as far as our hierarchy goes, we have a number of different offices, two major divisions, the Division of Economic Development and the Division of Travel and Tourism Development, which is the, the division that Lori runs. Um, DED, as we call it, also has within it all of our business recruitment and expansion activities. So we have three staff people who work in that area. Their job is effectively to work with businesses from outside of the state and sometimes within the state to help them uh, find new locations or to uh, relocate themselves uh, here into New Hampshire. Uh, we have a retention team that is set up regionally. These are uh, staff people who are trained in economic development and business technical assistance, and they work uh, with a number of partners uh, together to bring services to existing member uh, members of the New Hampshire business community. Uh, small to large business, they build relationships in their regions um, and and are a real touch point for those businesses to a whole host of different actions and uh, and and um, uh, goals of what the, the business are trying to achieve within the state. So we do work with Department of Transportation, Department of Environmental Services, uh, New Hampshire Employment Security, uh, Department of Energy, and lots of others to um, be that sort of touch point for the business community. Uh, we have the Office of International Commerce, so all the state's international uh, activities and export work is done within BEA. Uh, we have a staff of three people in that in that office, primarily funded uh, uh, federally under the SBA STEP program, um, but uh, they are able to uh, really be a, a resource for businesses, particularly smaller and medium-sized businesses that are looking to get into uh, uh, export activity and uh, identify markets around the world for the types of products that they're looking to sell. Two of our newer divisions since we were last year, as I'm sure many of you are aware, uh, the Invest in H, the housing program, is administered by BEA and a staff of three people. Uh, those are the uh, That's the $100 million Invest in H program that comes to us through uh, federal ARPA funds. And, uh, the, and the broadband uh, office is also within BEA also funded with ARPA funds uh, and ultimately with some infrastructure legisl uh, infrastructure uh, funds from the federal government um, managing a number of different programs to expand um, uh, the access for broadband for people in unserved, underserved locations. Uh, the Office of Workforce Opportunity is within us. That uh, ministers the Federal Workforce Innovation Opportunity Act funds uh, with New Hampshire Employment Security, these are for uh, adult disadvantaged and youth programs. Uh, one of the major ways that we are able to provide services both to people that uh, are looking to change positions, but also uh, some disadvantaged uh, uh, um, members of the of the population, as well as work with businesses that are um, experiencing um, downsizing and layoffs. We will work with those businesses to help their employees uh, get relocated quickly into a new job. 
The Bureau of Visitor Services is a uh, is um, uh, the operational component of the department. Uh, we have a staff of uh, I don't know off the top of my head, but there's probably about a, a, you know, seven or eight staff here in Concord. Plus, we have a lot of part time and full time staff that are staffing the rest areas and welcome centers uh, around the state. That's under a contract with the Department of Transportation. Um, we have a, 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 an also addition this year is the Office of Planning and Development. They came over when we uh, established the uh, the Department of Energy two years ago, uh, and they broke up what we used to call the Office of Strategic Initiatives, and um, the Office of Planning and Development came to BEA at that point, and we've been happy to have them. Uh, we have our Office of uh, Outdoor Recreation and Industry Development. This is another federally funded program that gives us an opportunity to uh, connect the dots on economic development and outdoor recreation and tourism. Um, uh, travel and tourism is uh, really one of the major functions of the department. I'm going to let Lori talk about that in just a minute, but um, the Division of Travel and Tourism Development is the marketing engine of the state, the marketing engine for tourism. Um, I guess we get some of the nice pictures that are in some in, in your uh, handout today that come from that, uh, but also have been seeing some very significant results uh, for the investments that we make into that. And again, I'll let Lori expand on that a little bit in a moment. Are there any questions so far, Representative Ebel? Sorry, I went through a lot of stuff no, there. Well, that's fine. Um, and I don't know if you're going to get into this. What are the deadlines on use of ARPA funds? So under ARPA, we have to have the funds obligated by the end of 2024. And then we have to have those funds uh, fully expended by the end of 2026. So that would be as uh, in relation to the Invest in H housing program, the programs that we are now funding for housing development have 18 month windows on them for that reason. Further so question, sure. You, you said for the housing you had a hundred million, but I didn't hear you say a number for the broadband. Yeah, so the uh, so we're getting we have different sources under broadband, some of which we haven't got the funding yet, so we don't know what the total is. But to date, we uh, we have under the the old care the, the capital projects fund under ARPA, the, the number is one hundred twenty two million dollars for that program. We expect probably at least that much when we get the infrastructure uh, funding under what's called the bead program, which we expect to see later this year, maybe this summer from the federal government. Representative McGuire. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Hi. What does the 120 million get us What for, for broadband? So where we are with that is we have, uh, we, we, we've done two rounds of what we call the broadband connect program. So this is a program that is designed to get as many unserved and underserved locations uh, into the served and uh, uh, you know, access to high-speed internet as quickly as possible. Um, and so we did uh, issue one award back, I think it was late last year, around December, to New Hampshire Electric Cooperative for $50 million. Uh, they are underway and, uh, and stringing fiber uh, through uh, the areas that they're responsible for and that they put in their uh, application. So that will total, uh, I think, as I recall, is around 23,000 new unserved and underserved locations. And that's all where they are and all that. It's all on our website. And if you'd like to see the list, I can certainly get it for you. Um, we're going to be issuing, uh, at, we expect to have at the next executive council meeting, the, uh, the uh, award for the second round of this program. And that we expect to be somewhere near that number, or another 20,000 unserved and underserved locations, primarily in rural areas in the state in the northwest of Concord. So once a customer um, you, uh, signs up for the service, they would still pay their fees similar to what a customer in Manchester or somebody else, somewhere else would pay, is that right? That would be how it would, it would work, right? I mean, you get hooked up and you have that access to, if you want to have that internet speed, yeah, you pay the same price. Gotcha. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Representative Hatch. Yes, thank you, Mr. President. Good afternoon. Good to see you. Um, just, just one of my areas of concern or continuing concern is our 
um, visitor services, i.e. our rest areas. Um, I was wondering if it would be possible uh, to get together something that would inform us what you need to have them open um, with more frequency than we currently experience. Um, it's just, um, in my mind, a little bit aggravating driving up the interstate, whether it be um, 89 or 93, and having our rest areas closed. It, 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 it um, just leaves a very poor impression for our visitors, I'm sure. And, um, and, and here, the Bureau of Visitor Services provides visitors with necessary and requested information is and enhance the visitor's uh, guest experience um, and it ensures uh, well, uh, visiting centers are welcoming. Uh, closed is not very welcoming. Yeah. So what can we do to address that? It's been an ongoing issue with me. It, it drives me nuts. We're a state that relies heavily on tourism, and um, I would think we'd be able to do a little better job in that area. Well, I share your frustration. I think the major problem is that we pay $12 an hour for people to sit in those rest areas and maintain them and clean the bathrooms and mow the lawns and all that sort of thing. And it's not anywhere near what the market pays for those. Okay. We have uh, most of the uh, services in the, in the uh, rest areas uh, that are open are on our borders, uh, primarily where we focus those. Uh, we have only one area that has had a, a difficult uh, time staying open at all in um, on 89, um, which one is it? That's Sutton. Sutton has been a difficult one. But we have, uh, you know, we just um, hired somebody to work at the Seabrook Center, and she lives in Concord. So they're willing to make, for whatever reason, she's willing to make that drive over to the Seabrook rest area. But um, we are, particularly in places like Colebrook and Littleton, um, we are subject to having staff. So if, if we don't have the staff to be there on a given day, then that obviously impacts our operational capabilities but that you know speaking for bob vashan who is the chief of this of this bureau mm -hmm. uh, he would very much share your frustration he is very um, inclined to have these uh, operations be what they are expected to be i think given the circumstances and given the labor market um, he's done a a good job at keeping the key ones uh, available and open where, you know, in the 93 quarters and the mass where we see the most people. But it is, you know, quite simply a, uh, a question of workforce. So I guess my question is, is what do we need to do to change those circumstances? What do we need to do to assure that there's adequate personnel to have these visitor centers open? I, you probably uh, would be, maybe not, amazed at how many comments I get from individuals about that. I'm still hearing about the one in Shelburne closing uh, way too often. Uh, and um, I, th I, th I think it's a serious issue, and I think it needs to be addressed. So to say the problem is we only pay $12 an hour, that doesn't answer my query. My query is what do you need from us to address that issue and assure that we have adequate personnel there to maintain them and have them open um, when visitors might expect them to be and when they can provide the service that um, is important yep. for, to maintain the visitor. Uh, we we have everything we need to operate the centers except the people. Okay. And, and that is not a, cons it's, it's, it's inconsistent. I would say in the, uh, in the main travel corridors, we haven't had as much of difficulty in getting those staffed. And it is as a result sometimes of asking people to travel the, quite a distance to be able to staff those centers. Um, but it does in some other areas put us in a position of being um, unable to stay open at seven days that, that we're all hoping to be able to be open. Well, I just need to know. <laughs> Again, what you need so that we can have adequate personnel mm -hmm. there to have them open. If it's we need more money to pay adequate uh, salary to those individuals to attract them to that job, that's what you need. Um, there's a couple other things. There's, um, I think I brought it to your attention before a few years ago, the CSEP program and things like that where you can get help for next to nothing and sometimes uh, – nothing and they're elderly but they are very reliable uh, and and good people to have on board um, 
and I, I think we need to pay a little more attention there, and I just need to know what you need. If you if we have to pay them nine hundred dollars an hour, what that would take? <laughs> yeah. I, I'm, being, yeah. I, yeah. I'm being yeah, extreme, but, but that. yeah, that's that's to make my point. Yeah, uh, and I understand, Representative. We've talked about this, you know, over the years. I, I, it is very much a frustration and a challenge. I don't think it's all that different than a lot of other businesses that I talk to on a regular basis that can't staff their manufacturing facilities, their healthcare facilities. I know we have we have a real labor shortage in the state, and these jobs, unfortunately, are at a point sort of within that income category that's near the bottom. If you're not working for us at twelve or thirteen dollars an hour, you can work at Dunkin' Donuts for fifteen or sixteen. So, well, it, so it, we're 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 in a competition. I, I'm aware of all that. Yeah, I know you. So are. again, back to my question, I want you to ask me what I asked you, so we have a clear understanding what what I need to know from you. So you, so if I could, I guess I'm as probably frustrated as Representative Hatch. Do you need to pay fifteen dollars an hour? I think that's what he's trying to get out of you. To you need to pay fifteen or sixteen dollars an hour. We just heard from the liquor commission that has an incentive program because they're having trouble to get people in, so they're going to put some incentive programs together. Uh, I've heard some from some of my friends, uh, female friends, that say they're disgusted to go to these rest areas uh, and use the facilities. And you go, and I do a lot of traveling around New England, Maine, New York, Vermont. They have beautiful rest areas, and they're staffed. So I'm well, they're often staffed by private sector. So the ones in Maine, you know, where you stop, they have people who work for uh, Kentucky Fried Chicken or or Dunkin' Donuts and those centers. And we have a, we have centers like the, at that like that in Hooksit, North and Southbound, and those, as you know, are well staffed. It's when you get to the to the facilities that are federally required that are just a center with a fireplace and two bathrooms and some brochures that this becomes a more difficult component. And there are federal regulations about what you can put in those centers. So we can't, we've, for example, we went to uh, the Intervale uh, Center up in North Conway or in Intervale, just outside of North Conway. Mm -hmm. And uh, we asked if uh, the local chamber would work with us to help staff that facility. Uh, and then they, they were not willing to do that. And then we worked with White Mountains Attractions because they have a facility in Lincoln that's not one of our welcome centers, but it services that if they would want to do one on the other side of the White Mountains. And they also said no. So it, 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 it's not like we're not looking for solutions. We have worked with uh, Depart Department of Administrative Services to address the pay issue. Uh, we did get the uh, clerks that work for the Bureau of Visitor Services to a pay level that is similar to people who work for state parks. Uh, so, you know, lining up all the different categories that they have there. And that has helped to some degree, but we still have challenges in some areas of, of the state uh, as it relates to these. And we have 12 of these centers, and as I have said, uh, our goal is to keep the main transportation corridors staffed uh, seven days. Uh, some we're, we're there most of the time. I would say 80 to 90 percent. We're in that category. And if we're not, it's going to be like a Tuesday. It's not going to be on a weekend. But some of the centers uh, outside of that sometimes get uh, a little bit more difficult. So what's the specific problem with um, up in Lebanon, the one just outside of Lebanon, 89? I know that I've heard from reps in that area that just caught a party there and it's well, the porta potty thing is another whole is another whole issue, right? I mean, there those you know, we we contract that service with a third party, um, who are in the same boat as we are as far as staff. So we have had situations where I've heard the same thing that you've heard about the condition of the porta potties because somebody didn't show up to work on Sunday that pay that drives the porta potty truck, and it got left, and so you've got a whole weekend in there and that it is it is not a place that you want to be but again i i you know we have a contract with someone who's supposed to deliver they don't have somebody to drive the truck they don't show up and that's that's the situation we get in representative mcguire followed by representative evil thank you so just more detail do the people who work in these centers are they full-time or part-time it's a mix okay mostly part mostly part-time mm-hmm so that one, it's straight pay, right? Mm -hmm. Going from 12 to 16 or something mm -hmm. would help. Yes. yes. Okay. Um, 
And what about the greater use of Granite State ambassadors? So uh, we do use Granite State ambassadors in the Hooksit uh, welcome centers. I don't know sort of the status of their use or their availability in the other centers. I would have to check on that, but we do not use uh, Granite State ambassadors in the other centers. Yeah, and it, I, I think you and could- I think some of them have training, I should say, but yeah. you know, the Granite State ambassadors do a training program and our staff is trained by them, but yeah. they're just not actually giving us the individuals. Yeah, but I think you could push it a little more. I mean, they take, I do think you, they take a little money from you, right, to run the things, but, um, but I think that's a possibility of getting more people, not to clean bathrooms, but to meet visitors. Right? Yeah. So, yeah, I am one myself, so. <laughs> <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Who knew this would be the hot topic? Yeah. It's somehow it often becomes yeah. like Well, so I'm just going back in time. I remember there was like this big rigmarole between DOT and you folks as to who owned the facilities, who was maintaining them, who was responsible for mowing, and, and, and then there was going to be an MOU. I mean, yeah, so that all got worked out. So yes. it's now very clear. So DOT owns? Yes but you run the whole show. Correct. We manage the, the facilities. And that uh, MOU was something, something that was a source of <clears throat> uh, a lot of uh, discussion uh, prior to BEA. And when we came in, and again, our bureau chief, Bob Vachon, worked with DOT and we got that all set. So we're, we're in a very happy place with them right now, yes. <laughs> Representative Hatch. Thank you. Back to my original question. When might, might I expect an answer? In terms of what I need to keep the centers open? Yes. Staff. I need staff. And what you need to do what you need to do in terms of finances or otherwise to get that staff. That Well, I don't want to just off the top of my head, but it's going no, to be I, more than what we're paying now. Yeah. So um, you could get that to us within a, a week sure. or so. Sure. Thank you. All right, Commissioner, moving right along. Um, maybe what I might do at this point is maybe turn it over to Lori uh, to talk about uh, the, the marketing work that we do at the department and uh, walk you through some of those components. And then I'll just come back right at the end and talk a little about kind of what we're looking at for the next, for the next uh, two years. Uh, and then we can continue discussing whatever you'd like. That works. Sounds good. Well, thank you for having me today. Um, so just a little bit more about the marketing efforts that uh, the Division of Travel and Tourism does. So we are a staff of nine people. We have a lot of different contractors that we work with. Granite State Ambassadors is one of them. Um, but other contractors like an ad agency, PR firms, um, research firms. So uh, it's a really a multifaceted approach that we take in promoting New Hampshire as a travel destination. Um, our total budget is about $9.5 million. Um, and just give you some comparison on how we are with our most competing states, um, because as you know, now that um, we are back in, uh, or we're recovering from COVID, Competition is going to be fierce because uh, people have lots of different options to go to to travel. So oftentimes we compare ourselves based upon population, uh, geographic location with the state of Maine specifically. Vermont as well, but it's a little different than um, what, what New Hampshire's characteristics that are. Uh, so the state of Maine's total budget is about double of what we have to spend to market our destination. Um, so it's very important that we do it uh, very smartly, data-driven as we move through this um, and in a variety of different tactics. Um, we also, as the commissioner had pointed out, that we are really the marketing arm for the state. So what we, and I, I guess the silver lining with the pandemic was that we really uh, began working very closely with other state agencies um, in terms of the need for the tourism industry, but a variety of different um, sectors. So one, we've also worked with like the DMV on CDL uh, marketing campaigns. We've worked with um, employment security on trying to recruit workforce because we really see t uh, today's travelers as tomorrow's talent. So it's a, a great um, 
PR, if you will, campaign to convince travelers that, hey, you probably would want to consider living here, working here, being part of uh, New Hampshire's land landscape. So as I mentioned, we do this through a variety of different ways. We, um, through the pandemic, we actually um, adjusted how the target markets that we promote New Hampshire in. Um, historically, we always looked at uh, New England, New York, and Eastern Canada. Um, with the pandemic, we expanded our marketing reach to a 600 mile radius of uh, New Hampshire, and we saw some great return on that. So we're continuing with those efforts. Also, um, moving forward to uh, uh, continue to market in Canada as the borders have opened again, it's very critical for us to uh, retain those travelers that had come down to New Hampshire before the pandemic, but as well as our international or overseas travelers. Um, specifically, we're seeing trends that the traveler from uh, Eastern, uh, Western Europe, excuse me, are getting back to the levels that they were before the pandemic to the US. So it's important for us to also be targeting those travelers because they are not weather dependent. They stay longer, spend more money. So it's very important for us to keep them as part of our marketing mix. Um, we are really, uh, we I think in your packet, we've got some examples of some of the ads that we've done, but it's a wide variety of whether it's television ads, billboards, or out of home ads. We do these destination takeovers. So there, we like took over back bays, uh, at, um, T stop station in Boston. Um, we have a lot of digital advertising as well, so that we can really track how the traveler, um, uh, from the beginning part of the funnel, the marketing funnel to how they, where they choose to come on their final vacation location. Um, so we do that. We, um, we, so we measure that through our return on investment and it's a very conservative, uh, um, uh, uh, estimate that they put forward our research firm, which is Smari. So they really look at the total, they survey our whole, the areas where we market look at who um, has seen the ads, who we have influenced and who actually has come to New Hampshire. So those are really more of a data-driven um, approach to prove the investment that for every dollar that we spend, it returns um, the latest one that continues to increase year over year, but the latest is a, about a $16 return on investment. We also, um, as we're looking at the, um, the workforce and um, uh, just the the migration rate of New Hampshire, we see that continuously moving forward and increasing, which is a, a positive um, uh, um, approach for the state. So that is encouraging and we'd like to continue on that as well. And um, the last thing that I wanted to bring up is that we continue to um, look at the state as a whole and the best strategy on how we can um, develop and market uh, the state as a tourism destination. So we are uh, continuing to do that. We're working through a strategy now for the next five years, um, the plan, and so that we can really, historically, we have always looked at number of visitors and how much they spend, but we wanna make sure that we're looking at all data points that we are um, looking at for those travelers that are gonna um, also make sure that we have a sustainable tourism and moving forward. So um, that's really kind of the, the plan of attack for tourism for us. Questions? Representative from Mont Vernon. <laughs> I'm kind of interested in the demographics of the state, but I'm also interested in the demographics of the tourists. And who do you rely on? I know the university has a uh, section there where they do some pretty good work on demographics. Uh, who, who do you people rely on? Yeah. Well, well, I, I, you could speak to tourism, yeah. I think. Uh, as far as you're absolutely right, Carsey Institute and the University of New Hampshire has a really robust program of tracking the, the migration numbers and the number of people that are, the, the net migration number is really what we're looking at. Um, when you when you kind of get to that point and you look at what they've been able to uh, you know track over the last several years uh, and compare that to other northeastern states, uh, we come out on top every every year, so it's not in and of itself, you know, going to change 
uh, huge numbers. And you're talking a couple of thousand people probably uh, each year. But that is a in positive territory is a very different place than where we have been in the past. Yeah, and in regards to the uh, tourism visitor, we look at specific, so for example, we market in, in New York, right? So we, um, we, we adjust, like we had, um, so marketing in New York is very expensive, um, especially in the city. So actually we had started off there many years ago, but then as we wanted to really drill down on what typical traveler is gonna come to New Hampshire from New York, most likely right in the heart of like, you know, uh, New York City, it's a lot of, visitors, they're not necessarily residents. So we've adjusted to uh, specific communities around that would be more typical to come to New Hampshire that have that income level that would be worthwhile for us to try to, to encourage them to, to consider New Hampshire as a travel destination. And we do that in all those main target markets that I mentioned earlier. Other question, you. Representative Griffin? So kind of piggybacking on Representative Griffin's question, how do you determine, like, for instance, the average taxable trip spending? You obviously don't have the commissioner standing down in Nashville <laughs> stopping cars periodically to see how much they spent. So how do you determine those numbers? Yeah, that's a great question. So we work with our research firm, which is Smari Insights, and they uh, survey um, travelers that are from these core markets that we market to, and they use a, a benchmarking um, uh, analysis that's based upon national data that uh, evaluates typically what the spend would be. So we take that amount per traveler and base it upon um, the incremental um, visitors. So how many did we influence to come to New Hampshire? And that gives you that total spend. Representative Ebel, did you have a question? Thank you. Well, you um, used the word that I was sort of thinking about making your tourism sustainable. Could you talk about the effect of the weather, snow, mm. foliage? Mm. Yeah. Whatever you want to say. <laughs> That gives me heartburn, right? <laughs> yeah. So um, it's a great question. And so, yeah, it's very important for us to look at sustain sustainable tourism. So in the sense of climate, so that how can we help those businesses that are in the state adjust how their, how their operations are? So many ski areas have adjusted to add other activities such as zip lining, um, uh, fat tire biking, um, a variety of different other activities that they can do to help balance out those that shorter ski season that we're seeing. But we're also looking at sustainability in the sense of um, such things as our infrastructure for like uh, for EV vehicles and you know knowing that um, states like other states like Vermont and Massachusetts have um, a pretty aggressive uh, look at that that we want to make sure that New Hampshire doesn't fall behind in the sense that if people wouldn't, don't have a place to charge their vehicle, would they not come? So looking at it as a whole and for sustainable tourism in that sense, so. I might just add to that. <clears throat> I mean, this is a challenge, right? I mean, you've, we've, we've got a tourism market that is based in large part on outdoor recreation and access to natural resources and all those sorts of things. Um, but as we have seen over the last couple of years, particularly since COVID, just a tremendous increase in the number of people that are looking to be able to take advantage of those types of uh, assets. So, you know, if you've been to Franconia Notch during the summer, the last couple of years, we worked with DNCR and state parks and DOT to address people parking literally on the side of the interstate uh, in minivans with their kids and getting out, you know, with logging trucks going by. This, that was a completely untenable situation. And we came together, you know, state parks, particularly Franconia Notch State Park, it came with, a, you know, they got some vans and we started to have people park up at the, up at the Peabody lift and, and then we would drive them down. But um, the increase in activity, as you will hear, like from Scott Mason at Fish and Game and the number of rescues and the way that state parks is moving towards a reservation based system to be able to control crowds. These are all aspects of what I would say is a post-COVID uh, outdoor recreation slash tourism strategy, all seated in the fact that that is a, not an infinite natural resource, and uh, at the same time trying to grow and maintain a really critical industry and employer for the state of New Hampshire. So 
that is really our challenge uh, right now. And we're working with, as, uh, as Lori pointed out, uh, a firm to kind of give us a little bit more insight as to how we might be able to accomplish that uh, as part of a state strategy where we're not just purely just, you know, measuring how many people came and how much they spent. I mean, I think we need to go a little deeper than that and talk about ways that we can get people to go to other areas instead of just to Franconia Notch or just to the Appalachia Trailhead or just to Diana's Baths, you know, the places that are just clogged with people in the middle of the summertime. So it, it is a challenge and we want to be able to accommodate those people and give them a very strong experience when they come here. And in the end, that probably has uh, some strong connection to what we end up with. Further questions, Representative McGuire? Thank you. So you mentioned uh, migration and I read an interesting statistic recently that 30% of all home sales in our state are to people who don't live in New Hampshire. Mm -hmm. And of that 30%, over half are people from Massachusetts. Mm -hmm. So to the extent that you're marketing, and, and the other thing about Massachusetts, they just recently passed this horrible um, tax, uh, millionaire's tax. So, so, you know, they're already primed to move <laughs> and, 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 you know, get the, the boot is kicking them out the door kind of thing. So for for your marketing f dollars do you do you kind of over market extra in massachusetts do you push a little there well i mean you've you're you're you're, you're correct representative and that is uh got to continue to be a big part of our challenge airbnb uh, uh it's a good example in a lot of areas like the mount washington valley and increasingly up in littleton bethlehem and those areas uh you have um people that can afford a house in Bethlehem that work in Boston. So they'll buy the house, aim to go there someday, but in the meantime, they're going to rent it to all their friends from Boston. Um, not so bad for tourism, at least in terms of that dollar figure, but pretty bad for tourism when you've now taken away a home that could have been an employee that worked at the, you know, at the ski area or at the restaurant or whatever. So mm -hmm. these are all significant challenges. I would say that they are uh, probably more in the side of influenced by market and by cost and by uh, other other sort of financial drivers than they are by marketing. Uh, the marketing component, I think, gets the people interested and gets them here. Uh, we've been doing that for some time. We're seeing that increase, but a lot of it is really based in the market dynamics where as expensive as it is for people who live in the North Country uh, in, 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 in relative comparison to where they've been in the last few years, it's extremely cheap for people that are from uh, you know outside of the Boston area, so that becomes a challenge. Uh, and you're you're also correct. We are seeing increases of uh, home sales, particularly in southern New Hampshire, since that millionaires tax or whatever we want to call it was passed in Massachusetts. Uh, I think I saw somewhere that a house just sold on the seacoast for something like twenty five million dollars. So um, <laughs> it's it's we're we're getting into the category that we've seen in a lot of other states. On the housing thing. Thank you. That's a very interesting statistical situation, I guess. It is. Yeah. And the Airbnb thing, I look, I get it, but it's sort of like what Uber did to taxis. It, and 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 try as you may in a couple of different jurisdictions to try to get at that from a statutory or legal standpoint. It didn't you know, there there wasn't any real basis for that. There was doing maybe increased cost here or there. But we can't say you know, straight out, like you, you can't Airbnb your house. I mean, we can't do that. Um, there's probably other ways that you can get around the edges, but whether that fundamentally turns, you know, change the dial, I don't know. But it's it's a pretty interesting question. I want the dynamic. Always a lot of challenges, Representative Ebel. Thanks. Well, I was just going to say, we just sold our house, and I had five offers, you know, like that, and everyone but one they were looking at having just a second house in New Hampshire yeah. and it was a family house and I was determined that it would go to the family. So that's where it went. Yeah. But you know, if you're, if you're not mindful of that, it just keeps sucking things out away from families, making everything. Worse. Yeah. And we're trying to, on the other side, you know, facilitate more affordable housing, workforce housing, make investments in those categories. But you know, the market itself is taking away a lot of, you know, what was there to start with. So 
unquestionably uh, the biggest challenge, in my view, the biggest challenge to, to the economy is housing. And that's, I think, good examples of why that is. It's not all zoning, though, man. Uh, Representative McGuire. Uh, well, just to, along this discussion, I'm on the planning board for my town. We had a developer coming, visited us this week, who wants to build a 15-unit development. And he says he simply cannot build a $400,000 house anymore. Mm. These are going to be $550,000 yeah. houses. You know, it's just incredible. I was at a development uh, this past week, uh, multifamily, uh, I think it was like maybe 50 units. And uh, while we were there, and these are energy efficient units, they're under construction right now. They all had these, you know, cruddy looking doors on the front of them. That's because the doors haven't been available. Uh, and they ordered them, I think he said like 15 months ago. And while we were there, they, the truck actually pulled in with the doors and everybody was super excited about the. <laughs> but I mean, it's an interesting conversation because what it does, the, the whole business of development has completely changed as a result of supply chain challenges, labor force challenges, all these costs that we've been talking about. Um, the way that they develop these things and the amount of money that they have to front uh, in order to order the doors, probably before they're even permitted, uh, in order to make the the finances pencil out, uh, that's you know that's going to ripple through everything, zoning and, and all the rest of it. Uh, so um, we are in the midst of a lot of change, and most of it due to COVID. Very interesting discussion. You know, we're wrestling with affordable housing, but because of our tax situation attracting people with money here that are buying up the properties so those folks that are looking for the affordable housing are even pushed out further yes interesting well very oh further question representative well, no i was going to say i think we have to do something along the lines of allowing more multifamily. you know places where because my town zones away multifamily, right and so we have to we we can push to that a bit, in my opinion. <laughs> I would agree with that. that. You know, density is not a bad thing, right? And um, where we have been able to see multifamily developments in communities that are willing to have those, there have been pretty tangible benefits to those communities from an economic and a community standpoint. And those are not the types of units that are going to be Airbnb'd. Not in, in maybe in some cases, but in in, in most cases, not. Yeah, a, du a duplex is is not twice the cost of a of a single family home, right? Right. right. You know. So. True. Yes. Representative Griffin. Thank you, Commissioner. I wonder if you can ask this question. We, uh, I I served on the uh, commission on uh, demographic change, <laughs> and we had a lot of people come in from UNH and other places and basically got a pretty solid education. We didn't do much with that. <laughs> One of the questions that was raised at the time that we didn't get an answer for is a few years ago, we changed the state law so that you could have an accessory building oh, yeah. on your lot. And the mm -hmm. idea of that was to promote affordable housing on mm -hmm. the theory that a lot of people would build that kind of housing for their in-laws, and over time, those units would become available as affordable units. Mm -hmm. um, but nobody seems to have any statistics on how that works. Have you seen anything on that? Uh, I would say if they are there, it's with New Hampshire Housing. I mean, they have been running an ADU program, and I know that they have. You know, they are the repository of a lot of data. That, that we often will use for uh, for these types of questions. So I'd be happy to check in with them and see if they have any information and get it to you. Uh, but I don't know it off the top of my head. I'm sorry. I believe those are the people that we asked. <laughs> well, it was a few years ago. Maybe they've had some time to look into it. I'll ask for you. Yep. Well, seeing no further questions, thank you very much. It was very useful presentation, I think, for all of us. And I know Representative Hatch looks forward to how we can get people into the rest areas in the next week or two. Thanks. We'll Have a good weekend.
Thank you for having us. It's always a pleasure.